the uh, the 19 was fermented and aged in stainless. You can see we are in stainless steel. What's the purpose of that? So with um, with stainless, it's non-reactive, which means it's not going and it's not going to contribute flavors. So really, we're just getting the essence of the juice. That said, you will often, when you're, ferment, when you're fermenting and aging in uh, steel, it will seem really steely, but there are no compounds that are actually exchanged. That's where you're getting of oak on the wine. So this, uh, this year, we harvested on September 2nd, since so we've had uh, the fermentation of uh, the fruit first come in for the Tempranillo. And I'm gonna show you how we kind of read a tank. It's gonna be kind of difficult, but uh, because it, you know, I'm kind of taking a look here, but I have, on each tank and on each barrel, we have a little coding system. And it's our way of making sure we, everyone knows what's going on and where. We also have a little, uh, a little electronic tag. So whenever we're working with the wine, we can zap it and that information automatically gets uploaded into the database. So everyone always sees who is touching which wine when. So uh, this came, this got racked over to this tank. Racking is moving, one, moving wine from one vessel to another. And we racked it over here on 930. But here's the coding system. TWF, welcome to the wine foundry. The vintage is 2020. And then we say rosé. We still have Tempranillo on here, but we've actually assembled the base already. And it's a little bit different from the 19, which Steve just kind of outlined. Right now, the base that we have is, um, is a combination of Tempranillo and Morved, Morvedra. And it's 80% temp, Tempranillo, and 20% Morved. And then as we, because we, it gives us, the, the Morved gives us a little bit of body, and the Tempranillo is nice and razor folk. Long into the aging process and Patrick begins to assess when the blend is gonna be happening, probably late January, early February. Then we start doing trials with these other pieces that we have of Rosé. It might even be 80-20 or 2% from something else. Um, then let's check it out. So I have a little cheater valve here and I'm just spraying alcohol on the tank so that uh, in case there's, uh, if I leave any drips or anything like that, fruit flies won't hit it and we'll, we won't be potentially uh, contaminating the wine with little other microbes. I'm gonna pull a little bit off this cheater valve. Fantastic. And I'm gonna show you what it looks like because you're gonna see this is not a finished wine. Notice how cloudy it is, okay? There's still a lot of particulate matter in there because uh, we're, we're just kind of finishing up primary fermentation. And so there's still some activity in here. You can even see some CO2, some little bubbles. And eventually what happens when the yeast is completely dead, it will start to trickle down and it will eventually fall to the bottom of this tank. You'll see on every tank, if you ever come to the winery or at any winery, you'll have multiple valves of different heights. Once that stuff, once the schleck or the heaviest particulates kind of precipitate down, we'll rack the clarified juice off that upper valve and we'll leave some of that lees or the sediment material behind so we have a clarified wine. Now this, with, in this state right now, it kind of slows, like there's uh, almost like a little layer uh, on top of it. We're not getting all of the esters, which Steve will talk about shortly. So at this stage, even, even though we haven't, uh, we still have the particulates in there. So huge amount of like red grapefruit at this stage. And that, a lot of that is volatile. So that will start to kind of disappear uh, in the, we'll see that beautiful citrus element, uh, but it'll just be more complex. Right now, we're talking fresca, and then we'll get layers with a little bit 
more uh, a little more opportunity. Um, so this grape harvested on nine two. We did the fermentation where the, the the yeast eats the sugar, and now we're and now it's it's starting to age. But I think we should kind of take a bigger, deep, deeper dive into fermentation. Uh, we're going to take a little look into what is fermentation with Dr. Steve Ryan and the world of zymology or uh, zyurgy. There, zyurgy. Steve, can you kind of talk to us about the study of fermentation? Um, I'd love to, Stu. Thank you. I appreciate that lovely introduction. Also referring to our wine and fermentation as Fresca is super cool. So um, I don't even think they make Fresca anymore, but uh, sorry. Yeah, that's a shocker for you. Um, yeah, fermentation. Okay, so the basics and everybody, a lot of people probably know this. Basically, and I'm gonna use a visual aid here. In the wine, you have sugar and you have yeast and the yeast comes and eats the sugar and has two major byproducts, alcohol and CO2. And so uh, if you're making beer, you wanna trap that CO2 in. If you're making sparkling wine, you trap that CO2 in and that carbonates the, the beverage. But for us making still wine, we let that go off. And that's why you can hear in the background, there's a lot of fans going on in the winery right now. We are basically excavating the uh, uh, CO2 out of the building. Philip passed out about seven minutes ago from it because he's really tall and, and so it just sits right there. But um, uh, so the CO2, we let drive off. And, uh, and then the alcohol obviously is um, what we're all doing here. So those are the main, the main things that happen. But what a lot of people don't realize is that the other byproducts are what are called higher acids and higher alcohols. And these come from biochemical pathways um, that happen during fermentation. And those higher alcohols and higher acids come together to form what Stu mentioned earlier, which are esters. Esters are aromatics and they're flavor compounds. And they are, you know, I'll back up for a quick second. Um, this all happens because of the yeast. Yeast is everywhere. Winemaking has been going on for tens of thousands of years, all blah, blah, blah. Awesome, cool stuff. Modern day winemakers, talented winemakers, we know fermentation is going to happen. We actually can't, we can barely stop it if we wanted to. What we can do is control it. And we can control it by temperature. We can tr control it by cultivated yeast and, and dictating what yeast is gonna be dominant in the wine and in the fermentation. But uh, for the most part, uh, what we really wanna do to control those esters is control the temperature. So as Stu mentioned, that, uh, that Tempranillo and the Rosé was harvested, I think he said 9-2, I thought it was 9-6, but either 9-2, thank you. Um, so I, with that, and we just racked it on 930. So that's a, about a four week fermentation that happened there. And that's what we would call slow and low. It's a very technical term. And basically means that we fermented the wine at about 52 to 54 degrees for about three to four weeks. And, um, and at that point it got through there. It's still kind of muddling through the last little bit of secondary fermentation, which we'll talk about on the 28th. And it's another chapter in, in the, in the book, but, um, the reason we want to do that is to really control those temperatures because on white wines and on rosé wines, that's where you're really going to get those kind of big time aromatics. Um, some of it absolutely comes from the, the fruit and that's a basis of it as well as the AVA and where it's grown and the soils and all of that. But a lot of it's the yeast and how we manipulate that and how Patrick and his winemaking team really um, steer the course for the most part. So, um, Stu, is that is that you know essentially what uh, what you're looking for? Yeah, absolutely. And um, and so Steve did a fantastic job, kind of explaining the basics of fermentation. Another thing to consider that you know that Patrick and the team weigh are sugars, right? So that we can kind of nail our uh, identify what our alcohol, our potential alcohol level will be. And so that's why we'll keep it, we'll, before we even inoculate uh, with yeast, which I'll be talking about in just a second, we'll keep the, the, uh, the juice or the grapes really cold for, for maybe a, a couple of days. So that way we can, with a large mass in there, we'll have more data and we'll be able to identify what the potential sugar, what, what the sugar level is or a closer approximation of, of the sugars. So then we can determine what the alcohol level would be uh, in the finished wine. 
Um, Steve kind of mentioned something called yeast. Uh, and so there's different yeasts that we will kind of use during the process. Um, you know, Fernando, our, our enologist, you can see I'm kind of mixing up, up the but we will often start with something called native yeast. And the, all, there's yeast everywhere in the air, okay? And, uh, and on the grapes when it comes in. And so what we'll, uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll often let the yeast begin the fermentation process uh, that are we'll something called, we'll go native. And that will begin the process. And some winemakers prefer to use the native yeast the whole time. However, other people will use, um, or will often after about day two or day three, introduce a cultured yeast strain. And uh, there's a whole bunch of them. These are natural strains. I'm ha holding up one right now called uh, Rhone 4600. Um, we have RP15, which is often used for Bordeaux varietals, wines that need like maybe slightly higher alcohol or a little bit more, uh, a little more full bodied. I'm pulling up right now AMH, which is one that's called Aschmannhausen, often used for Pinot Noir. Um, and RC212, a Burgundian, a Pinot yeast strain, but it's also kind of a greatest hits. People use it for a lot of the things. And D254, often used for a lot of things. D254 though, doesn't really have the alcohol tolerance. It's kind of more made for finesse, finesse wines. It often doesn't really like to make wines above 14.7 in alcohol. So uh, what we do is we'll, we'll take, we'll take uh, one of these hydrate, one of these packets and we'll begin to hydrate it. And we have to, we, we know that Steve was saying like, we'll ferment the whites at colder temperature and when it's cold, the kinetics are going to be a lot slower, moving a lot, lot slower. Um, so what we'll try to do is to at least build the yeast population, have it at a slightly warm temperature. And depending on the mass of the fermentation, we'll do a simple calculation to determine how much yeast should be in there. You saw in that photograph of Fernando earlier, he's kind of mixing the yeast in with the, the warm water, and then he'll take juice from that fermentation or from, from that wine and mix it in. So we'll be introducing some sugar and we know the yeast feeds on that sugar as Steve was talking about. Once that yeast starts feeding on that sugar, uh, we'll have, an, and the, the population starts building up. Then what we'll do is we'll introduce it into a little part of the fermentation tank. And once we see that that's really healthy uh, and, it, and you'll see bubbles, the CO2 really start piling up, then what we'll do is we'll either punch it down in, in one kind of a tank, which we'll talk about shortly, or we'll pump it in so that the, uh, the yeast can start finding that sugar everywhere. Um, well, yeast is, you know, we'll often, you, you'll hear people talk about fermentation as an anaerobic activity. Not really, because yeast does use oxygen. So it's kind of, some people say it's functionally uh, aerobic. It, when there's oxygen present, it will use that oxygen to help it. But when it's in an anaerobic environment, let's say inside the tank and it's, there's not a lot of oxygen, the yeast can adapt and go anaerobic to can do that conversion. But we will we'll use different methods, which Steve will talk about to introduce oxygen to make the job of the yeast easier. So it's yeast is the vehicle, as Steve was kind of showing his Pac-Man reference. That's just kind of fermentation science. But the beauty of how we actually and the flavors into the wine is what we call is extraction. And so we'll kind of take, take a journey into that with Steve. Steve, can you uh, kind of talk us about how, how does the winemaker, Patrick, or, or any of us here, get the flavors in the wine? So, well, now I think we're kind of going into red wine ferments, if, if, that, if that's fair. Um, I'm, it's a little bit easier to talk about extraction, I think, in, in the context of red wines. So, with that, 
as Stu mentioned, we're going into tanks predominantly. And um, extraction is what we're looking for on, I'm going to stick with red wines here, is extracting color, flavor, and tannins predominantly from the skins of the grapes. So uh, many people don't realize that, that I think it's all but like four or five, uh, maybe six grape varieties are white. They just have red skins, uh, but they're white pulp and white juice on the inside. And so there are, you know, four or five, six that have red pulp inside. Um, but really all that color is going to come from the skins. And so in order to get that and to get the most depth of, of color and tannins and structure and that beginning of mouthfeel on the wine, we need to extract those tannins from uh, their seed tannins, but mostly from the skins. And so in order to do that, we're going to go ahead and we need to continually grape skins. So what happens is we talked about CO2 as the primary byproduct of fermentation. That's it's going to push the grape skins naturally up through just the, it's going to float right up based on the CO2 gas to the top of the tank, or as we'll show over by Stu, to the top of uh, the bin that he's pulled out to use as a visual aid, just so it's a lot easier to fetch a phone out of a bin than it is a tank. So we're using the tank today. Um, but as we, as we get into that, yeah, there you go. Um, as we get into that, the, the skins will rise to the top and eventually they'll, after the first few days, they'll form what's called a cap. That cap is very dense um, on a tank. It can be, you know, five, six, seven feet deep. Um, you really, you cannot punch your hand through it. It's like hitting a brick wall. Um, so it really compacts and you need to keep submersing that and keeping it wet. So we'll take the juice. I don't know if you can see this, this drain valve here on this tank. This tank is, is uh, um, got a drain valve here. It's all buttoned up because there's wine in this tank. And, um, but we would basically pump off of this drain valve and go back up on this pipe, which goes up to the top and it's got an irrigating sprinkler at the top. And so that's gonna take the juice off the bottom and then spray it all over the top of the cap. That wine's gonna filter through the cap. And by doing that, it, well, it's got a number of functions, but by doing that, it's going to, um, it's gonna go ahead and, and filter through there, collecting more tannins, more structure, more, more color. And uh, that's all part of the extraction. The number one thing that we want to do with the extraction, especially on big red wines, is we're going to turn the heat up on the tank right away. And this gets back to how winemakers can manipulate the whole process. So we're going to go ahead and, and pack it up. You know, uh, we want to get heat on it fast. We have hot, hot glycol. I feel like Mike Pence here. I'm sorry. Um, we're going to get uh, hot glycol on the, uh, on the wine as quickly as possible. And uh, and it's, I'm sorry, it's gonna go ahead and, and uh, cause more of that extraction. And it's just like, if you're, if you're you know, macerating berries with some, with some water on a, on a stove and you turn the heat on it a little bit, it's gonna, it's gonna macerate faster and break that stuff down. Same exact concept, really. Um, the other... Yeah, but uh, can I toss a question to you though, Steve? Is that okay? A question came in on my telephone. Is that okay? Sorry, I was reaching there to kind of move it out of the way. Um, so we got a question from, it looks like Laura, thank you. Uh, I am, I should not be muted. Uh, it says I'm not muted. Um, oh, okay. All right. So uh, we got a question in from somebody in, uh, named Flora who came in on my telephone. So that's why I was kind of reaching there and trying to make it go away. Um, so th thank you, Flora and Scottsdale. Uh, and Steve, it's a two-part question. It is, uh, okay, it's about Syrah. So Flora is studying for the WSETs and likes watching the show. Sorry about that, but thank you. Um, so what is the purpose of stem inclusion and, uh, and what grapes do you usually So Steve, if, if you're, if you can't get it, uh, I can take it, but first of all, on Syrah, what's the purpose of, of stem inclusion and part two, which grapes do you usually blend with, uh, with Syrah? 
and I just got another text that we kind of lost Steve, so I'll jump in here. Laura, so STEM inclusion, and for people at home, we harvest all the grapes by hand, which means they arrive in as clusters, okay? And so with those clusters, we have options. We can either, depending on the grape varietal, we will either keep the, the berries on the stem and ferment with the stem, or we will remove the berries from the stem and just ferment the fruit. And a lot of this is simply, uh, a lot of this is simply uh, traditional as to which grapes are used for which purposes. So typically, Pinot Noir in certain years, or Rhone varietals, Syrah in certain years, we will do stem inclusion, which will ferment with at least a portion of the stems. And the purpose, well, a couple of things. Number one, with, with that wood in there, you typically get a little more color, but you're also gonna get like a little briar patch character and a little more texture, particularly in the mid palette to the finish. So that's why stem inclusion. The challenge in California is that our weather is so good, typically, that uh, our grapes will ripen very, very quickly, but we won't have the flavor. And so you can imagine if the grapes ripen really quickly, them would be bright green. We wouldn't see a lot of what's called lignification when they start turning woody. And if we fermented the, the stems when they're bright green, we'd be introducing kind of an herbaceous, um, almost vegetal flavor in the wine. So we'll, we, we don't always ferment with the stems. We just wanna make sure that it's gonna serve the wine. Your second question was about, oh, about blending varietals. So um, the Rhone varietals of which Syrah is one in the new world over here, we'll typically blend with a grape called Petite Syrah. So Syrah will give, it, Petite Syrah is kind of mid palate to finish and kind of a, uh, on, on the palate and also kind of a nice big fruit, uh, fruit pop. It's kind of a, a muscular grape. Then there, it's also traditionally blended with Grenache, which is a very light and delicate grape, um, almost like Pinot Noir-ish. And then another grape called Morved, uh, Morvedra, which is kind of more earthy and kind of has tannins, a dryness, which are a little bit more muscular. And then you just go through trial and error to shape the wine to the style that you are looking for. And, but in the new world, we also don't have rules. So we could also blend with um, Zinfandel if you wanted, or, or even the Bordeaux varietals, Cab Franc, Merlot. Um, we're not kind of, we're inventing new traditions here. And so it just depends on what your goals are. I hope that helps out. For your um, for your W sets. Um, hey Steve, welcome back. And I have another one more question. If you want to jump on it, um, Morgan, Calistoga, Morgan, we hope you're okay. Um, hey, isn't 2020 a little early for harvest? And does the early harvest impact quality? I think I got that right. Steve, you want to grab that one? Yeah. So I, I think uh, is it basically saying like right now, is it too early to harvest? Uh, is, is that, was that the question? Yeah, okay. Um, so har harvest changes, you know, we're dealing with agriculture and we're dealing with mother nature. And so there have been a number of, of heat spikes. This, 2020, and, and yes, there have been fires and there have been a lot of grapes that we and other wineries have not been able to harvest. However, the vintage as a whole, uh, for what fruit did come in and was able to come in away from uh, smoke, um, which was, I haven't done the exact math on the tonnage, but I'd say it's about 50 to 60% of what we were expecting. Um, so that's a little challenging. It just means that the grapes that we did bring in are very sound quality. There's just not as much of them and, and that's a bummer. But to really specifically answer your question, Morgan, um, it, it, it fluctuates every year, you know, ever since 2012, we've had a great string of vintages, um, really one after the next. It's pretty much splitting hairs between whether 15 was better than 14 or 15 better than 16 and so on. But, um, but it's always varying by a few different weeks. You know, we kind of, we kind of have markers in the growing season where we say, okay, for Asian hits. So we're going to say, we're going to, we're going to hit 
you know, we're, we're seven days ahead of last year or we're seven days behind last year. But then you get a heat event and you can manipulate that in the vineyard a little bit, depending on how the water is doing. Uh, vineyards are all very different. Sometimes there's a hard pan, maybe six feet under part of one block. The rest of that block might be really rocky. So that's the, the job of the viticulturist and, and the farmers to work with Patrick and understand when we want irrigation put on, when we don't, when we want to speed it up. But really, you know, again, you're looking at Stu mentioned bricks earlier. That's the common kind of nomenclature for when to pick. But at the end of the day, when you're dealing with high-end wines, you're picking on flavor because that's what you can't change in the vineyard. And if the flavors tell you you're ready to pick, then you're ready to pick. And um, you can adjust the sugars, you can adjust the acids, all of that. A lot of you on this call have probably heard us say this a number of times. But really, so there's no reason when it's early to pick. Um, we oftentimes deal with a lot of vineyards. You know, we have very diverse growing regions. Um, vineyard selection. So even in that, we have from eight different vineyards that span east to west, north to south, valley floor, mountain fruit, benchland fruit, and all of that. And so all of those are going to pick at different times. And um, and yes, there are some sites that we were still hoping to harvest. We weren't able to harvest um, other sites in the valley floor. We you know the the first fire of the August complex hit, um, and that was up in the eastern Baca range, but we were actually able to harvest successfully a lot of our valley floor stuff and the stuff on the west side. And uh, we did lose a few there, but you know, it just means less wine, but the wine that's made this vintage is killer. Um, so that roundabout way, I guess, of answering your question that never too early to harvest, the fruit tells you when it's good, when it's ready to pick. Um, was there was there a second part, Stu, or did I forget? Yeah, well, yeah. No, you, you got it. You got it. But there's a lot more questions. Of course, I was looking at the ones that were coming in on my text and not the ones that were coming in on the screen. Folks, we're lo-fi. Okay. So, uh, so I just want to apologize for that. So I'll take, Steve, I'm going to send one to you in a second, but I'll take one really quick. Heather Parks is asking, hey, with the, with the, the low assumments for the white wine, is the low temperature slowing the process down so you can test and stir flavors or the low temperature develop deeper and better flavors? So Heather, with, so if we just let the grapes ferment on their own, fermentation would last four days. So you, if you remember back like the old uh, Ernest and Julio Gallo commercials with, uh, with um, uh, Orson Welles uh, on the commercial, he would say like, we will make no wine before it's time. Kind of setting the belief that it takes years to make wine, but the grapes, the yeast will eat all of the sugar in four days if we just let them go. And, um, and they will, I will say, I often say they will burn bright, which means it'll increase the temperature dramatically and sometimes even kill themselves because it's they, the, the energy that's being created, the kinetics becomes too hot for them and then they poop out. So when we're fermenting reds, we actually have a slightly higher higher temperature because we're extracting the color and the flavor only from the skins. The skins, seeds a little bit. And to the other question um, from Flora about we'll be, if we're doing that, we'll get it from there. So, uh, and, but, so a red wine fermentation will tip it. We'll try to control the temperature as Steve was talking about. So maybe it's a 10 day ferment so that it, we can extract, we have enough time to extract those colors and flavors. Once we're getting below eight bricks and so, we're not really getting any more color or flavor anymore. It's a matter of just getting the sugar out of there. With the whites, on the other hand, he said, we try to get our fermentations much longer. And the reason is we are not fermenting whites, white grapes on the skin. So where do we get the complexity if all the complexity is supposedly in the skin? So it's playing with the yeast. So we can kind of keep those esters in there. And if you ferment one uh, wine at 16 degrees C versus if you ferment another wine at 18 degrees C, you're gonna get different aromatic compounds and different flavors. And that is just a matter of the style that you are trying to create. So I hope that kind of answers your question uh, regarding temperature and we'll play with different temperatures depending on if we're making a shard for somebody, if we're, if we're doing a Viognier or we're doing a Sauvignon Blanc or that Rosé, which we were talking about, extended out for almost a month. 
Hey, Steve, I'm going to toss another question to you. This one comes from Kurt Parkinson. Uh, and Kurt, wait, I don't quite know where you are. And Steve used to be a, a, a brewer for Gordon Beers for many years. So it's a beer question, Steve. So how do wineys compare to beer? We always have a bottle, an anaerobic, a bottom feeder, uh, or an ale, an aerobic or top for fermentation. Does this par paradigm of bottom yeast or top yeast fermentations translate to wine? Different strains, same genus, but, but different strains. Still Saccharomyces and Cerevisiae. Um, but the biggest thing is that they're, they're more alcohol tolerant. So um, if, you're, if you've ever made beer and you maybe have made a, either a mead, like a honey wine, or a, um, which a lot of brewers will do, or a, um, like a quattro bock, or maybe a, a, a barley wine, actually that's probably the biggest, the best example. A lot of times you might hit it again with a wine yeast or a champagne yeast really to kind of handle that, that higher alcohol. Um, and another part of that is that there's more oxygen being given in the wine uh, fermentation when we're doing those pump overs and punch downs and introducing oxygen, that's actually gonna, the yeast is gonna use that to strengthen its molecular structure. So it's gonna strengthen its cellular wall uh, by, by using the oxygen. And so that's, that's one of the ways that it can become more alcohol tolerant. Um, and that's what Stu was kind of touching on before between the difference of a, of a fermentation and a, and a respiratory process. Um, so I, I, I hope that answered the question. Um, yeah, okay, I got a thumbs up from my buddy over there. Um, and then we have a couple more questions. Uh, I'm gonna um, so uh, somebody was kind of talking about something called de la stage, uh, which is a way to well, there's two there's two different questions. Something uh, I'm, I'm gonna do the the somebody asked if there was a uh, and I erased it, so I can't tell who it is. Sorry about that. Is there a cap on whites? So no when you're fermenting whites, no ish. Because on a traditional white wine or what we modern traditional white wines, we don't ferment on the skins. We take the grapes, we stick them in a press and we ferment the resulting juice. However, in the days of yore, uh, the way that people would take all grapes, whether they were red or white, is they would ferment them on the skins. And all the cool kids on the block in the last 15 years, and we're the cool kids on the block, um, but really in the last five years are doing something called uh, skin fermented whites or amber whites or dark whites or orange wine, where you take white grapes, and orange wine, thank you, and you ferment them on the skins. And so you will extract tannins and flavor. You'll get a highly aromatic wine, but you'll also, the, the palate presence will be really drying. So you'll get almost like a dessert wine quality, it depends on the grape you're using. We often do it with Gewurztraminer to get a grape known for, for big aromatics. And then, um, and then, but the palate presence will be all just like a, a, a red wine, really dry uh, and tannic. So that is a category called orange wines and, uh, uh, look, I loved orange wines. Our winemaker, director of winemaking loved orange wines. Our, our general manager loved orange wines, but we were very skeptical about making them because we didn't believe that there was a, a market in the, uh, for consumers. We were wrong. The owners, Philip and Valerie of uh, the Wine Foundry were right because we've sold out every vintage that we've done of orange wine. So there are a vocal, uh, a vocal um, group. And I'll just quickly do De La Stage. So basically what that is for people who are interested, you kind of remove the juice from the fermentation and then you get more and then basically get more skin contact. So you're extracting more uh, color, more flavor. And the question that we will do is if we're doing that for the wine, because look, we're making several hundred wines. So it really depends on the style for the particular client. And if somebody's looking for a little more extraction, a little bit more bold, we will go for a de la stage. Um, 
Steve, should we go into punch downs and then we'll get some of the, a, a couple of more questions. All right, so Steve is gonna kind of walk us through a punch, uh, a punch down. And we're just gonna do it in what's called a T-bin, which is behind me here. T-bin, uh, called a T-bin because it only holds a ton as a pun to one of our giant fermenters, which you'll see um, when, we're, when we're talking about something called pump overs. And uh, Steve referred to something called a cap. And this one is just finishing up fermentation. So there's not much of a cap. And, um, but you can still see on top that these are all the skins, okay? But underneath, and Steve was saying, sometimes it's, those caps can be seven feet thick on the large ones. Usually on these tea bins, which holds about a ton of fruit, about 2.3 bar uh, barrels, you can see where the cap was yesterday. It was up here. And now that it's finishing up, it's starting to fall. And what we'll do is depending on where it is in the fermentation cycle, we will go around with this giant potato masher and insert the skins back in to extract color and flavor. Right now, base, I'm not really going for extraction. We just wanna keep the, the cap clean and, uh, and put it into the anaerobic environment. And so just to keep the microbial environment really happy, then I'll clean this up. But basically the moral of the story is the caps up here, all your color and flavor, all the juices down there, wait, if all the color and flavors at the top, all the juices at the bottom, I'm not getting any color and flavor extraction. So I got to push it down. And if you want a wine that is what we would say more extracted, more color, more flavor, you might punch it down five times at the height of fermentation. But if you want something more restrained and elegant, you might only punch it down three times or two times at the height of fermentation. It's, that is just the stylistic element. And we just want to get what's going to be best for the wine. What's going to be best for the style of wine that you are trying to create. Um, from personal experience, punching down those, those big fermentations, holy cow, you use a bunch of muscles. On, uh, in 2000, uh, six, 2000, not 16, 2006, I fell in a fermentation um, and I had to do some dumpster diving because I lost my glasses in the ferment potentially really dangerous because all the CO2 is in there. Um, and unfortunately it was on my wife's birthday and uh, they hosed me off and I showed up in the restaurant and the hostess was not happy. Uh, she was like, who is this guy? But that's punching. Um, and you notice I don't go to the bottom of the bin because the seeds kind of fall down there and we don't want to break the seeds because the tannins in there are, um, can release really bitter phenolics, really bitter phenols into the wine. The other way where we extract color is something called a pump over. And Steve's gonna walk us through the pump over. And I think when he does that, we also have a really cool video of, um, of us from the drone. And it was amazing, uh, Jenny was shooting a drone in here. And this is just moments before the drone went uh, a little bit higher into the winery, hit the ceiling and came crashing of the earth. So if you want to make a contribution, so for Jenny to get a new drone, uh, and we want to get that footage of the drone plummeting to its untimely demise. Steve, talk to us about, talk to us about pump overs. All right. Uh, thanks, Stu. So here we go with the pump over on the screen. Um, this is good that I can see in the background there. Basically, it's this is what we call a fire hose pump over. So that's on an open top, meaning that there is no lid to the tank. And uh, and you can see I, I can't tell which of our which of our uh, colleagues is, is doing the pump over, but um, spraying it like a fire hose, irrigating that cap. Same exact principle that Stu is doing on the punch down, um, but this is pulling off from the drain valve on the bottom of the tank. And, uh, and, then, and then spraying the wine back over the top, getting that extraction, that color, that structure, those tannins, as well as irrigating the cap and keeping it healthy. Um, I'm not sure if the drone fell to its untimely death yet. It did? Oh, not yet. Okay, and we're back. Okay, there we go. We didn't get the crash. So, um, well, that's a bummer. It's kind of, it's kind of you know, it's really quite a bit of buildup for, for no return on the crash. But hopefully you got the idea of the, uh, of the, uh, pump over. Um, all of our tanks, our closed top tanks, we can't really show that to you because 
Uh, what's great about the winery here is we invested in having dedicated pumps attached to each of the tanks. So, if, if, Philip, if you can pan to this right here, the go video's going. Oh, got it. Never mind. So, uh, oh, it's replaying. Okay. So, on, on all of our closed top tanks, now we're good? Okay. Um, on all of our closed top tanks, for example, this is a closed top tank. This is a, what is called a 300, uh, three, to three ton tank, a 900 gallon tank. So, a very small tank. Um, this uh, has a lid on it that stays on. It's totally closed. It's a closed system. We have a pump, and this one here is set up. You see these hoses here. There's a pump mounted to the bottom of it, and it's pulling off on this on, on this racking valve, going to this irrigator valve up to the top where there's a sprinkler arm. That's all controlled by this tank net device. So you can see right now, we're heating it up. We've got a set point to 89.9 degrees, and actually we've got a bracket here. So we basically are saying, um, at 89.9, we want it to cool. At 85, we want it to heat up. And that's the temperature range that, that we want on this wine. Uh, this is uh, our Foxtrot Vineyard Oakville Cabernet Sauvignon, um, which I've got a little sample of here. It's, uh, it's dry, basically. I think it's at about 1, 1 1.2 bricks or something today. So it's almost dry. Probably another couple of days, it'll totally be dry. Um, and uh, this tank net controls the amount of pump overs. So um, Patrick or Jeremy or Fernando on the winemaking team or Connor, they'll go ahead and uh, program in how many times and, and how frequent they want these pump overs to happen. Literally, Patrick can be sitting in pajamas on his couch, doesn't even have to come to the winery and he can just program it in. Um, so that's really the, I guess that's more the art of winemaking, not really the science, but, uh, but that's kind of what we do. So the, the pump over you saw was on an open top, a little different. This is our uh, 2020 Foxtrot Oakville Cabernet Sauvignon. Second year we've worked with this vineyard. Um, very pleased with it. It's on uh, Money Road, right off of Oakville Cross Road. It's got a lot of structure, a lot of opulence, a lot of fruit, a lot of blue fruit, really nice. Um, so we've got good acid on that so far. Um, Stu, I don't know if you've tried this recently, have you? Right. Let's do try it on Friday. Okay, so you, maybe after the session, you'll have to try it again. Um, so this is getting pretty close. And basically, uh, this will this will go into extended maceration for probably five to eight days or so, depending on when Patrick makes the call to go ahead and send it, send it in the work order to press it. Um, so this has a little bit more time on it still, but that's an example of, of what we're doing with extraction. I don't want to get too far ahead into the next section because that'll be uh, October 28th. Hey, Steve, can you want to take a question while you're on fire? Uh, wow. Uh, whoops. Yeah, specifically uh, about, about um, how about uh, glycol and 4-methylglycol? So somebody was asking if there's visible, um, if there's visible ash, George, I think. And George, I, I, I think that's who it is because I can't, I don't have my chat up on the screen, so I can't see the name anymore. If there's visible ash on the, um, on the grapes. Basically, how do we test for uh, whether a wine could be smoke painted and what did we do if, uh, and how do we test for it? How's that? Yeah, let me get off mute. Okay. Oh, I'm off mute. Okay, Yahtzee, hello. Um, okay, yeah, so there's a few different things that we do. We uh, send it off to uh, a lab or a number of labs. Um, right now, a lot of the labs are really backed up. So we've actually been working with the lab out of British Columbia for most of our stuff. Um, does the same exact, it's the same accreditation as ETS, which is our normal lab here in Napa. Uh, they also have one in Paso and also Oregon, but they're all very backed up. Um, so we work with uh, Super R&D out of, out of British Columbia. Send it off for a smoke assessment. And there's more than just, I, I don't know if uh, the question specifically cited glycol and 4-methylglycol, but those are two compounds that are identified as uh, markers with smoke taint or potential for smoke taint. There's also a number of, of creasels and some other indicators that is, as people are learning more about it, it's not just about the glycol and the 4-methyl. Um, the difference between those is basically 4-methyl glycol is bound to the sugars glycol is free it's 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 open and could bind so there's basically a threshold and if it tests you know over a certain threshold then you know that the the presence is there and there is a possibility for the smoke to to taint the wine at some point 
Um, and when that's when that happens, we get those analyses back, and then we have to go to the growers and talk to them and reject the fruit. Uh, we can't really take the risk on that, especially for the folks we're making barrels for. Can't do it for our own products. Growers understand they have crop insurance, or we should. And um, and it is what it is. It's just a, a cruddy part of the business when that happens, but it is what it is. Um, the other things that we'll do while we're waiting for those analyses is we'll do micro ferments. And so we'll go out and we'll pick about 50 to 60 pounds of grapes from the block, a very uniform sample of the block, and we'll come back to the winery and do a very small ferment, literally in, in big pails or, or even like garbage cans size, size pails, and do a, exactly what we would do if it were in a bin or a tank. And uh, there's a certain protocol that's put out by uh, UC Davis, and we follow that to the to the T. And then basically, you take those and you, and you can find out if there's going to be anything growing on the ferment, anything that, you know. Usually, you you might get a a bacon type quality or a smoky barb, you know, actually really kind of appealing aromatics. Uh, but if you get those, then you basically take it to the grower and say, "You can smell what I smell. You can taste what I taste. It's there, and we can wait for the uh, results." But that's how we reject fruit. When we get the assessment back and it's clean, then we take the fruit, especially this year. Uh, vintage has been killer. It's just, like I said earlier, it's just not enough of it. And, and that's, the, that's the real bummer. So, um, but uh, yeah, uh, does that answer you, Stu? Is is coming in, uh, and Dave. I'm sorry, I don't I know how to pronounce the 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 town. It, I don't know if it's St. Simons or St. Simmons Island in Georgia. And and Dave asks, what wine options are made in the egg? So we have a number of eggs here, and what he's referring to, and unfortunately, it's, it's around the corner, but uh, but it's uh, it's an egg shaped thing that's made out of a a concrete like material, and we typically do a couple of different wines in the egg. Uh, we'll often do Sauvignon Blanc, about two thirds of it in stainless and about a third of it in the concrete egg. I think we're about to get some visuals on the egg shortly. Steve's, Steve's walking over there or one of the eggs. And, uh, and we have a lot of debates about this, but uh, basically the, supposedly the shape of the egg, since it's that allows that if you look at a fermentation um, a number of years ago, maybe 15 years ago, I moved the heads on a barrel and looked at, I put plexiglass on there. So you could see the fermentation kind of spinning around like this on a, on a white, on a Chardonnay, or actually it was on a Marsan Roussan blend. Um, but the, the shape of the egg allows that convection to kind of happen. And the marketing behind it is that you supposedly get a little more, uh, a little bit better fermentation kinetics. The way it displays on the palate is a little bit richer, rounder. We find it's a really good blending component for the Sauvignon Blanc. We'll also do SB Sauvignon Blanc, a couple in neutral oak barrels, barrels that have been used three or more times. We also use it for reds, often with Malbec. We usually don't make Malbec or not a lot of people, only a couple people make Malbec as a standalone. Most people use it when they're blending Cab Sauv, Cab, Fr Cab Franc or Merlot. And so we love the palate presence it brings to the Plate. I hope that understand. I hope that kind of makes sense about of how we use the egg. Heather is chiming in with another question: Were the grapes that we were showing before whole, squashed, or stomped for that cap? So it depends. On this one, uh, this part particular fermentation, we did whole berry, and you can imagine if you can see my hands. Then if if all the color and flavors in the skin. The only, uh, the only part of the skin that's touching the pulp is going to be the surface area. And so we would get a more berry lighter driven wine. Now in reality, once we start punching it down and moving with it, the skin start breaking down. But you can imagine if we start crushing the berries and we typically don't do it with our feet, although we do get some, we'll do some stomping, um, but that's how we get the earthy undertones in there, especially if you use my feet. We'll typically do it uh, with what's our crusher destemmer. And it's not really crushing, it just splits the skins. And so now you can imagine that there's more skin in contact with the pulp and we get a little more extraction of color and flavor. You don't have to do 100% crushed berries or 100% whole berries. It depends on the style. 
You might do 20% crushed fruit or 80% if you're looking for a little bit more. It just depends on what you are going for. And uh, I believe there's one question that also came in on the text and I'm gonna take a look at it right now. And Steve, I'm gonna to toss this one to you because I'm gonna be trying to navigate to a different screen on my play phone. So uh, Gary Marcus in the chat uh, function said, hey, picking a single varietal that you make, do you use one yeast strain or do you do multiple yeast strains? Would the use of multiple yeast strains make for a more complex wine? Sure. So, and the reason I say sure is because everything has multiple yeast strains. And I, this is, I, I'm going to sound like kind of a, kind of a tool explaining this, but, but uh, there's, there's natural yeast on the grapes that come in. Um, there's a natural yeast. We, we probably have our own facility yeast here between all of the different grapes that come in, all of the different yeast that we use. It's all airborne. And then we also inoculate. So, Yes, when we inoculate, that becomes the dominant yeast. We oftentimes will try to go native and, and very successfully, I'd say probably 75, 80% of the time, but we may give it a kick with it with another yeast strain. So um, technically everything has multiple strains, um, but generally speaking, uh, we will go ahead and inoculate one strain. Uh, very rarely, we may need to give it a little boost. Um, happens sometimes on certain varieties. Um, or certain vineyards sometimes. There might be a nitrogen deficiency. There might be a couple different things that, that maybe we need to inject a little more oomph in there and get a kind of more finishing yeast to go in there about halfway through the ferment and, uh, and really take us home. So um, hopefully that wasn't, you know, too much of a sure type of answer. But, uh, but yeah, we, we try to do it all in one strain, but sometimes you can't. You gotta just take what, take what you get there. Perfect. Um, hey, anything else you want to? Another question just came in from from Ed. We'll we'll, we'll take a look. So Ed Sherpy coming in from the mighty metropolis of Texas. Uh, the cap were those grapes whole? Nope. We've already done Heather. I love you so much. It looks like there's no more questions. Ed said something which we'll get to in just a second. Hey Steve, anything else you want before we? Like mom and dad, or I see they're they're getting ready for bed. Uh, what, what you want to anything you want to say before we we ship off? No, I, I well, I just really like to say uh, from a standpoint of of kind of seeing everybody on here. It's it's great to see so many people on here uh, um, tonight. This is a fun thing to do. Normally our doors are open during harvest, so obviously they are uh, not able to welcome everybody as we would love to right now. So it's great. I see over 80 people on the, on the thing tonight and that's amazing. Um, thank you for joining us for this. We'll have two more of these October 28th, two weeks from tonight, as well as November 11th, we'll be dealing with, uh, kind of pressing and, uh, and, and then going into barrel and secondary fermentation after that. So, um, meanwhile, we, uh, We've got our book club next week, I believe, and uh, which Stu can talk about in a sec. We also have our Anarchist Wine Co. Inquisitive Sips uh, next Thursday um, at six o'clock as well. And uh, that's a, a, a kind of another version of Harvest. It's a little more centered around those wines and how we build up those wines and, and the ferments that are going on specifically for the Anarchist Wine Co. and Foundry Wines lineups. Um, but from, from the bottom of, of our hearts here, you know, it's been a challenging year for sure. But it's been a really great year and the support from so many uh, folks out there, clients, friends, um, people that are checking us out and everybody out there and wine enthusiasts in general. Thank you so much for joining us. Stu, can you tell us about the book club next week? Oh my goodness, Steve. I can't wait. Yowza, yowza, yowza. For all of our literary lushes and winos out there, um, we have Reading Between the Wines next Wednesday night. And look, some book groups you want to club the like the director over the head with it like a summer sausage because they're so uptight you can still try to club me over the sausage remotely we're not an uptight book group uh usually by the end we've spiraled pretty hard um but next wednesday night you're welcome to join us we're gonna be doing the botanist and the Vit vintner uh book that came out about 15 years ago by christy campbell and it's about uh this thing called um this outbreak of this little louse 
um, called phylloxera, which really we were nice enough to introduce to Europe in the mid 1800s and almost wiped out all of their wine, wine making. Uh, we did it to try to take advantage of that. But of course, then we got harmed by it. Uh, Steve's an alum of UC Davis. UC Davis screwed up again. They told us that this one rootstock AXR uh, was, was not was, was phylloxera resistant, it wasn't. So we got joint here in the 90s in Napa. And then in November, we're gonna be doing um, uh, Etienne Davido, his book, The Initiates, which is a comic book artist or a graphic, a graphic artist and a, um, and a winemaker switched jobs. So the comic book artist taught the winemaker how to draw and the winemaker taught the comic book artist how to make wines. And so we're going to be checking out this thing in, uh, in graphic novel form. And uh, I'm really excited about that. And then, um, but look, join us. Even Steve, Steve always says, even if you haven't read the, the book, join us. You are welcome to. But, uh, but I, you know, just uh, let's try to stay on tack and uh, on, on track. And, uh, and I just appreciate if you drink a lot during the sessions. That's about it from here. Uh, why don't we stop the record function? We'll answer any questions that anybody felt uncomfortable with.